we start our literature for week 32, we want to put 428 or 430 on your page in literature. All of you should write these notes down. You should listen, even though you may not have the book. Uh, some of you may not have the book, but uh, that's okay. You can listen and be sure to write down all that uh, is given in this lesson. So we're going to ask you to turn to page 108, and in your book, here's the, the great section where after um, Ivanhoe wins in the tournament, he's returning money to Isaac, and uh, Isaac uh, is, is uh, got girth. Girth is Ivanhoe's servant, so Isaac is uh, giving him uh, some zekins to uh, go back, uh, and Isaac is only gives him 80 zekins, and uh, on uh, the middle of, at the, at the very top of page 108, Isaac's counting them out, 71, 72, thy master is a good youth, 73, an excellent youth, 74, that piece hath been clipped within the ring, 75, and that looketh light of weight. 76, when my master wants money, let him come to Isaac of York. 77, that is, with reasonable security. Here he made a considerable pause. Girth had a good hope that the last three pieces might escape the fate of their comrades. But the enumeration proceeded. 78, thou art a good fellow. 79, and deserveth something for thyself. Here again. The Jew paused again, and he looked at the last <clears throat> second, intending, doubtless, to bestow it upon girth. He weighed it upon the tip of his finger, and made it ring by dropping it upon the table. Had it rung too flat, or had it felt a hair's breadth too light, generosity had carried the day. But, unhappily for girth, the chime was full and true, the second plump, newly minted, and a grain above weight. Now, what does that mean? It means that the... Uh, coin is new. It hasn't been worn down. It has more metal in it. It has more of the precious metal. So Isaac is reluctant to part with it. He's greedy. He's a, a businessman who won't, he'll, he'll give a, a smaller zekin, but keep the larger ones for himself. So this is his character. See, he's been trained to be this way in his life. Um, in some ways, he's very generous but it's always, uh, or often, it's to his advantage. And so here, he has this heavy zekin on his finger. He can't seem to part with it, but he finally does. He lets it drop into Girth's bag. Now, Isaac could not find in his heart to part with it, so dropped it into his purse as if in absence of mind with the words, 80 completes the tale. And I trust thy master will reward thee handsomely. Surely, he added, looking earnestly at the bag. Thou hast more coins in that pouch? So you can see uh, that the Jewish people who are business people, and they lent their money out uh, for interest. They had gained a lot, but they'd also become very shrewd in their business practices. Let's look on page 109. We're about 10, pay, uh, 10 <laughs> lines down from the top of the page, and it says... Uh, he remembered, however, moreover, that he was in the house of a Jew, a people who, besides the other unamiable qualities which popular report ascribed to them, were supposed to be profound necromancers and Kabbalists. So here's an interesting section where uh, because pe uh, Jewish people were often wealthy, and they had more money, and, and, and the English were uh, jealous of that, and uh, people were in debt to the Jews, and the, they tended to be the bankers. Uh, later in European history, the Rothschilds became the big banking house in, um, in Europe. And so uh, here, uh, these, these ridiculous things... Um, uh, I, almost like superstitions uh, come up and they accuse the Jewish people of being very strange and, and even practicing uh, bad 
things like necromancy and being Kabbalists. And so this is false, of course, but you can kind of see the, the root here, and, and this is way back in European history, but you can kind of see there was a prejudice against the Jews. And uh, people, I think, were uh, also upset that the Jews were God's people. They were kind of jealous of that. And so uh, what happens is, in an amazing uh, way, here at the bottom of page 109, uh, at the middle of the page, uh, a beautiful uh, lady invites Gerth as Gerth is leaving with those Zekins, she invites him to the side, kind of secretly. There in the middle of the page, she asked him the particulars of his transaction with Isaac, which he detailed accurately. My father did but jest with thee, good fellow, said Rebecca. He owes thy master deeper kindness than these arms and steed could pay, were their value tenfold. What sum didst thou pay my father even now? Eighty seconds, said Gerth, surprised at the question. So in other words, Rebecca is saying, we are so grateful to your master, Ivanhoe, for how he stood up and how he uh, has, um, you know, he's a fair person. He and, and, and you'll find in the story that Ivanhoe is not prejudiced toward the Jews. He Obviously, in the in the very beginning, he gives Isaac his seat at the fire. He warns Isaac that the um, that Brian de Bois Gilbert is going to try to uh, steal from him the next day, and so they leave early and secretly. And they get out of Rotherwood, and so you see how Ivanhoe is not your typical person who has prejudice against the Jews. Now look what. Uh, she does uh, for them. And they're very generous. This is a very generous gesture that Rebecca gives. And she says, in this purse, said Rebecca, now we're on the bottom of 109, thou wilt find a hundred. Restore to thy master that which is his due and enrich thyself with the remainder. Haste, be gone, stay not to render thanks and beware how you pass through the crowded town where thou mayest easily lose both thy burden and thy life. Reuben, she added, clapping her hands together, light forth the stranger and fail not to draw a lock and bar behind him. So she says, let him out and make sure he gets out safely. And she warns Gerth to be careful. And so great generosity, okay? Now, look at the very last uh, sentence there on 109. By St. Dunstan, said Gerth, as he stumbled up the dark avenue, this is no Jewess, but an angel from heaven. Ten seconds from my brave young master, twenty from this pearl of Zion. Oh, happy day! Such another, Gerth, will redeem thy bondage and make thee a brother as free of thy guild as the best. So Gerth is so happy that she has just given him this gift. So very generous, very thoughtful. In other words, uh, Rebecca is looked at very favorably. She's a very honorable uh, Jewish young lady. Now in the next chapter, chapter 11, we see that Isaac is jumped on the road and four men hold him down and they want to take his money away. And But then he talks about he's the servant of Ivanhoe and he's taking these Zekins back to Ivanhoe and these robbers let him go because they realize that uh, uh, you know they support Ivanhoe, they appreciate Ivanhoe and they don't want to steal from him. And so uh, there you have kind of a contrast. You have what? Isaac being very stingy, you have his daughter Rebecca being generous and thoughtful and uh, grateful, and then you've got these guys who jump, uh, girth in the woods, and they are what? Very uh, illegal. <laughs> They're stealing. 
But they also uh, honor Ivanhoe by not stealing that money. They're going to let it go. Let it go and let Ivanhoe have it. So that's chapter uh, ele uh, 11. Now, uh, the next spot that I think is really an interesting is um, we're going to go back just for a moment or two to the tournament. And I told you last week we would look at these Norman knights who were defeated. Now, as we go back in time to that first day of the tournament at Ashby de la Zouche, let's turn to page 85, <clears throat> and uh, we have the De Shadado, the uh, black knight here, <clears throat> this newcomer, De Shadado. El Deshado, signifying disinherited. And uh, <clears throat> he appears with this uh, shield, with the Spanish word Deshado. And uh, he appears in the list, and he rides up, and he touches the shields of each of these uh, five knights. He just basically challenges them. And uh, I wanted to read a little bit down on the bottom of 85. The champion, moving onward amidst these well-meant hints, ascended the platform by the sloping al alley, which led to it from the lifts. And to the astonishment of all present, riding straight up to the central pavilion, struck with the sharp end of his spear the shield of Brian de Boisguebert, until it rang again. All stood astonished at his presumption, but none more than the redoubted knight whom he had thus defied to mortal combat, and who, little expecting so rude a challenge, was carelessly standing at the door of the pavilion. Have you confessed yourself, brother? said the Templar. And have you heard mass this morning that you peril your life so frankly? I am, I am fitter to meet death than thou art, answered the dis <coughs> disinherited knight. For by this time, excuse me, for by this name, the stranger had recorded himself in the books of the tourney. And take your place in the list, said Boisgabert, and look upon your last upon the sun for this night. Thou shalt sleep in paradise. Gramercy for thy courtesy, replied the disinherited knight, and to requite it I advise you to take a fresh horse and a new lance, for by my honor you will need both. And then, of course, last week, as we looked at this, the knight, the disinherited knight, backs his horse all the way down the list and takes up a position. And so he represents all of the Saxons, and of course, Bois-Gilbert is representing the, um, you know, all of the Normans. Let's look at page 92 now, as we continue a little bit further. Page 92, the horse was led into the list by two grooms richly dressed, the animal itself being fully accoutred with the richest war furniture, which, however, scarcely added to the value of the noble creature in the eyes of those who were the judges. Laying one hand upon the pommel of the saddle, the disinherited knight vaulted at once upon the back of the steed without making use of the stirrup, and brandishing aloft his lance rode twice around the list exhibiting the points and paces of the horse with the skill of a perfect horseman. And so you see him parading. This is what they did in uh, a tournament. Let's go back to page 86 at the bottom, and here's the actual contest. When the two champions stood opposed to each other at the two extremities of the list, 
the public expectation was strained to the highest pitch. Few augured the possibility that the encounter could terminate well for the disinherited knight. Yet, his courage and gallantry secured the general good wishes of the spectators. The trumpets had no sooner given the signal than the champions vanished from their posts. So here we go. They're, they're in their charge toward one another in the lists. With the speed of lightning, they closed in the center of the list with the shock of a thunderbolt. The lances burst into shivers up to the very grasp, and it seemed at the moment both knights had fallen, for the shock had made each horse recoil backwards upon its haunches. The address of the riders recovered their steeds by use of the bridle and spur, and having glared on each other for an instant with eyes that seemed to flash fire through the bars of their visors, each made a demi volt and retiring to the extremity of the list, received a fresh lance from the attendants. So their first pass, both of them splinter their lances, almost being knocked off their horse, but the horses are knocked back, in, and that's how much the recoil is. So both of these knights are very able to stay in the saddle, even through a shock like that. Now, we're on page 87 at the top. A loud shout from the spectators, waving of scarfs and handkerchiefs, and general acclamations attested the interest taken by the spectators in this encounter, the most equal as well as the best performed which had graced the day. But no sooner had the knights resumed their station than the clamor of applause was hushed into a silence so deep and so dead that it seemed the multitude were afraid even to breathe. A few minutes' pause having been allowed, that the combatants and their horses might recover breath, Prince John and his truncheon signed to the trumpets to sound the onset. The champions a second time sprung from their stations and closed in the center of the list with the same speed, the same dexterity, the same violence, but not the same equal fortune as before. In this second encounter, the Templar aimed at the center of his antagonist's shield, and struck it so fairly and forcibly that his spear went to shivers, and the disinherited knight reeled in his saddle. On the other hand, that champion had, in the beginning of his career, directed the point of his lance toward Bois-Gabert shield, but changing his aim almost in the moment of encounter, he addressed it to the helmet a mark more difficult to hit, but which, if attained, rendered the shock more irresistible. Fair and true, he hit the Norman on the visor, where his lance's point kept hold of the bars. Yet, even at this disadvantage, the Templar sustained his high reputation, and had not the girths of his saddle burst, he might not have been unhorsed. As it chanced, however, saddle Horse and man rolled on the ground under a cloud of dust. To extricate himself from the stirrups and fallen steed was to the Templar scarce the work of a moment, and stung with madness both at his disgrace and at the acclamations with which it was hailed by the spectators, he drew his sword and waved it in defiance of his conqueror. The disinherited knight sprung from his steed, and also unsheathed his sword. The marshals of the field, however, spurred their horses between them and reminded them that the laws of the tournament did not on the present occasion permit this species of encounter. We shall meet again, I trust, said the Templar, casting a resentful glance at his antagonist. If we do not, said the disinherited knight, the fault shall not be mine. On foot or horseback, with spear or axe, or with sword, I am alike ready to encounter thee. More angrier words would have been exchanged, but the marshals, crossing their lances betwixt them, compelled them to separate. The disinherited knight returned to his first station, and Bois-Gabert to his tent, where he remained for the rest of the day in an agony of despair. So, he's been disgraced, and he lost this event. And as you know, each one of the 
um, encounters, uh, these combats that the disinherited knight has, he wins each one. So he, he encounters five of the knights. One of them he knocks to the ground with such force that you wonder if the guy's going to live or not. That's on page 89. That's the fifth of the combats. Let's look on that short paragraph. Page 89, first paragraph at the top. Ralph de Vimpon summed up the list of the stranger's triumphs, being hurled to the ground with such force that blood gushed from his nose and his mouth, and he was born senseless from the list. Now, normally when you see blood gushing from your mouth or your nose, you've done brain damage, and there's something that has been pulled loose, and so the person normally doesn't survive. Uh, having blood coming out of your ears is another bad sign, but we don't know. It doesn't say what happened to this knight, but he he is equally successful with each one, so he wins the prize, and... Um, the uh, uh, that's that's where he gives the prize to the and, and names the queen of love and beauty, and of course he gives that to his uh, really his love that he left to go on the crusade, and that is the lovely Rowena, who is the ward or adopted daughter of Cedric. So let's look over on page 122. We want to start this second day now of the uh, events. Of course, the first day, uh, this wonderful Saxon knight puts the Norman knights in their place and wins all. And now we have this second day. Now in the second day, this is a a larger combat. And there's two sides. There's a Saxon side and a Norman side. I'm going to read on page 122. If you would turn to 122, we will uh, take a look right in the middle of that page. It was a goodly and at the same time an anxious sight to behold so many gallant champions mounted bravely and armed richly stand ready prepared for an encounter so formidable seated on their war saddles like so many pillars of iron, and awaiting the signal of encounter with the same ardor as their generous steeds, which, by neighing and pawing the ground, gave signal of their impatience. So we have about 50 of these knights who've entered the list, and the list, of course, is a north-south list. It has an opening on one. You remember it's about... Uh, the length of four football fields, and it's a width of about two fields. And so this, uh, these lists um, have about 50 of these knights on one side, 50 on the other. They're separated by about three football fields, and they're going to start a fight now, but it's a group fight. Sometimes in... Um, the, the literature, you'll see that they had a, a word that comes from the French. It's called melee, a melee. And a melee means just a mess, confusion, uh, a huge, uh, like a battering uh, group, just a mass fight. So let's continue reading there on 122. As yet the knights held their long lances upright, their bright points glancing to the sun and the streamers with which they were decorated fluttering over the plumage of the helmets. Thus they remained while the marshals of the field surveyed their ranks with the utmost exactness. Either, neither, excuse me, lest either party had more or fewer than the appointed number. The tale was found exactly complete. The marshals then withdrew from the lists and William De Wivriel, with a voice of thunder, pronounced the signal words, Laissez alert! The trumpets sounded as he spoke. The spears of the champions were at once lowered and placed in the rest. The spurs were dashed into the flanks of the horses, 
and the two foremost ranks of each party rushed upon each other in full gallop and met in the middle of the lists with a shock the sound of which was heard a mile's distant. The near rear rank of each party advanced at a slower pace to sustain the defeated and follow up the success of the victors of their party. So we have these two ranks as they've lined up. They've got the first two ranks. They charge across at full speed, the first two lines, and they smash together in the middle of the of the of, of the middle of the uh, lists. And then the rear one, the rear group, goes slower pace and is moving up much slower to engage people that make it through the, uh, you know, and, and, and if, if someone retreats and needs out, one of the guys in the back will come up and fill their place. So most of the fighting is going here right in the middle, and, and it's very noisy. Uh, it's a very raucous fight. So the consequences of the encounter were not instantly seen, for the dust raised by the trampling of so many steeds darkened the air. And it was a minute ere the anxious spectators could see the fate of the encounter. When the fight became visible, half of the knights on each side were dismounted, some by the dexterity of their adversary's lance, some by the superior weight and strength of opponents, which had borne down both horse and man. Some lay stretched on the earth as if never more to rise. Some had already gained their feet and were closing hand to hand with those of their antagonists who were in the same predicament, and several on both sides who had received wounds by which they were disabled were stopping their blood by their scarves and endeavoring or trying to extricate themselves from the tumult. The mounted knights whose lances had already been, uh, had almost all broken by the fury of the encounter, were now closely engaged with their swords, shouting their war cries and exchanging buffets or blows as if honor and life depended on the issue of the combat. So would you underline that last phrase? That's the seriousness. It's as though the life and honor depended on their fight. Now, the, this is just a game. This is a tournament. But you can see here in the Middle Ages how this was a big deal. This is like the Super Bowl. You played for all you were worth. And it seems crazy to us because they're hurting each other. I mean, they're cutting. They're, uh, they're not supposed to kill but people get killed. Uh, the goal is not to just kill everybody, but the goal is to win over your opponents. But they're using sharp swords. Uh, this, this is a wonderful section uh, describing this, uh, this battle. The tumult was presently increased by the advance of the second rank on either side, which, acting as a reserve, now rushed on to aid their companions. The followers of Brian de Bois Gilbert shouted, Ha! Beau Seant! Beau Seant! For the temple, for the temple, the opposite party shouted in answer, De Shadado! De Shadado! Which watchword they took from the motto upon their leader's shield. The champions thus encountering each other with the utmost fury and with alternate success the tide of battle seemed to flow now toward the southern, now toward the northern extremity of the list, as one or other of the party prevailed. Meantime, the clang of the blows and the shouts of the combatants mixed fearfully with the sound of the trumpets and the drowned groans of those who fell and lay rolling defenseless beneath the feet of the horses. Can't you picture that? Can't you see the dust? Can't you see the sound or hear the sound? Can't you see those guys trying to roll around on the ground? They're wounded, and the horses are stamping all around them. Above, there's a battle going on. And now about half of the people are on the ground, and they're fighting with swords. Wow. Great description. The splendid armor of the combatants was now defaced with dust and blood, and gave way at every stroke of the sword and battle axe, 
The gay plumage shorn from the crest drifted upon the breeze like snowflakes. All that was beautiful and graceful in the martial array had disappeared, and what was now visible was only calculated to awake terror or compassion. Yet such is the force of habit that not only the vulgar spectators who are naturally attracted by sights of horror, but even the ladies of distinction who crowded the galleries saw the conflict with a thrilling interest, certainly, but without a wish to withdraw their eyes from a sight so terrible. Here and there, indeed, a fair cheek might turn pale, or a faint scream might be heard, as a lover, a brother, or a husband was struck from his horse. But, in general, the ladies around encouraged the combatants, not only by clapping their hands and waving their veils and kerchiefs, but even by exclaiming, Brave Lance! Good sword! when any successful thrust or blow took place under their observation. So, now in this uh, event, the Templar and the disinherited knight at length, they come together hand to hand. And if we'll turn over to page 125, we can see this next part, because what's going to happen now, anything goes, you can gang up on people, you can surround them, anything goes in this big uh, type of tournament, this melee. Uh, so what we see here on page 125, when the field became thin by the numbers on each side who had yielded themselves vanquished, had their uh, had been com compelled to the extremity of the lists or who had otherwise been rendered incapable of continuing the strife, the Templar and the disinherited knife at length encountered hand to hand with all the fury that mortal animosity joined to rivalry of honor could inspire. Such was the address of each in parrying and striking that the spectators broke forth into unanimous and involuntary shout, expressive of their delight and admiration. But at this moment, the party of the disinherited knight had the worst. The gigantic arm of Front de Boeuf on one flank and the ponderous strength of Athelstan on the other, bearing down and dispersing those immediately exposed to them. Finding themselves freed from their immediate antagonists, it seems to have occurred to both these knights at the same instant that they would render the most decisive advantage to their party by aiding the Templar, Brian, uh, Brian in his contest with his rival. Turning their horses, therefore, at the same moment, the Norman spurred against the disinherited knight on the one side and the Saxon on the other. It was utterly impossible that the object of this unequal and unexpected assault could have sustained it had he not been warned by a general cry from the spectators who could not but take interest in one exposed to such disadvantage. Beware! Beware, sir disinherited! was shouted so universally that the knight became aware of his danger, and striking a full blow at the Templar, he reined back his steed at the same moment, so as to escape the charge of Athelstane and Front de Boeuf. These knights, therefore, their aim being thus eluded, rushed from opposite sides betwixt the object of their attack and the Templar, almost running their horses against each other ere they could stop their career. Recovering their horses, however, and wheeling them around, the whole three pursued their united purpose of bearing to the earth the disinherited knight. Nothing could have saved him except the remarkable strength of the noble and activity of the noble horse which he had won on the preceding day. Thus stood him in more. Uh, this stood him in more stead. So the horse he he maneuvers very carefully and moves back and parries the blow of one of his antagonists and blocks the blow of another, and the horse does really well. But gradually, he still gets surrounded, and three against one are going to overwhelm them. Now, uh, down at the bottom of page 126, here's the decisive change. There was among the ranks of the disinherited knight a champion, in black armor mounted on a black horse, large of size, tall, and to all appearance powerful and strong like the rider 
by whom he was mounted. This knight who bore on his shield no device of any kind and hitherto evinced very little interest in the event of the fight, beating off with seeming ease those combatants that attacked him, but neither pursuing his advantages nor himself assailing any one. In short, he had hitherto acted the part rather of a spectator than of a party in the tournament, a circumstance which procured him among the spectators the name of the Black Sluggard, or Le, no, excuse me, Le Noir Fanion. At once, this knight seemed to throw aside his apathy, and he discovered the leader of the party so hard bested for setting spur to his horse, which was quite fresh, he came to his assistance like a thunderbolt, and in a voice shouting like a trumpet, De Shinado! To the rescue! It was high time, for while the disinherited knight was pressing on the Templar, Front de Boeuf had got nigh to him with his uplifted sword, but ere the blow could descend, the sable knight, meaning the black knight, dealt a stroke on his head, which, glancing from the polished helmet, lighted with violence scarcely abated on the sham front of the steed, and Front de Boeuf rolled on the ground, both horse and man equally stunned. So the chamfron is a little piece of armor that's right on the face of the horse. It kind of protects the front of the horse. So this sword blow hits front to buff, and then it also hits the horse on the head. And so it kind of stuns both of them. Well, as you know, having read this, this great combat scene, the black knight, the black sluggard here, Le Noir, Fanian is uh, successful, and uh, he knocks away Front de Boeuf and knocks away um, Athelstane. And now it's just Bois Gilbert and De Chirado. And let's look on page 127 where this, uh, this happens. Having uh, So about two-thirds down, page 127, having achieved this double feat for which he was the more applauded that was actually totally unexpected from him, the knight seemed to resume the sluggishness of his character, returning calmly to the northern extremity of the list, leaving his leader, De Shadato, to cope as best he could with Bois Gaber. This was no longer a matter of so much difficulty difficulty as formerly, the Templar's horse had bled much and gave way under the shock of the disinherited knight's charge. Brian de bois Gobert rolled on the field, encumbered with the stirrup from which he was unable to draw his foot. His antagonist sprung from the horseback, waved his fatal sword over the head of the adversary, and commanded him to yield himself. And then who saves the day? Prince John. Prince John pulls a warder out uh, and throws it down, which means this has to stop. And he proclaims De Shadada the winner of the tournament. So, uh, now here's where, of course, De Shadado is bleeding, and as he's uh, uh, recognizing his choice of, uh, of Rowena again as the queen of the day, he faints from loss of blood, and here's where he's now taken from the field. And he had a point of the spear from an earlier fight lodged in his side. So let's find that so you guys can take a look at that. That's interesting. Right at the end of the chapter, page 130, um, Ivan, uh, the cause of Ivanhoe's swoon had hastened to undo his armor and found the head of a lance had penetrated his breastplate and inflicted a wound in his side. So here's where Rebecca now is going to get involved in caring for him and nursing him back to health. So we'll stop at this point, and uh, we're going to part two right away.